not to change that. <laughs> Um, we might just have to get started and then I'll try and have a look at that in a bit. Um, so, yeah, so we're Girls Against, a bit of an introduction. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and Georgia, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, so um, I've been working with Girls Against for the past five years, I think it is. Have we been? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like yeah. <laughs> so long. Yeah. Um, and I'm one of the campaign coordinators, uh, mostly working in the Northwest. So I predominantly work with music mm. venues, promoters, bands, and different media outlets in the Northwest, just to raise awareness of all of the issues we discuss and to help make folk, uh, to help folk make their spaces safer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got a really exciting panel today, um, some amazing guests. So. We can just go around one by one each introduce yourself say a bit about what you do in regards to safe spaces um that kind of thing so if we'll start with emma do you want to go first yeah sure um, hi uh, i'm emma i kind of run a few things like fat outs my sort of uh, baby project so i've been running Fat Outs since 2008 when i moved up to manchester we started out working with kind of very kind of sort of post-punk, very alternative, rowdy, guitar-based music. And now we kind of work with many different genres, but we'll kind of focus on kind of obscure artists and ones that kind of work within, that really kind of, um, yeah, push boundaries in their genre that they work with. Um, and we also support and work with a lot of queer environments, um, queer artists and kind of making queer spaces and club nights. And um, I do a lot of work with body horror and bollocks and creatures of catharsis. Um, and we put on these like mad 12 hour parties, usually at the White Hotel. Um, I also am the creative producer of Sounds from the Other City Festival in Salford. Um, so that's a big sort of uh, city-wide festival. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work during lockdown about how we can kind of make that festival more accessible and working on our sexual health policy, uh, sexual harassment policies and sexual health policies. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the main main things that I do. I used to run the Islington Mill venue up until it closed in 2017. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of the work that I did when I was venue managing that, and then when Fat Out took it over, uh, was kind of understanding what providing a safe space for people to come to really meant um, and what it means to different people. Yeah, amazing, amazing work. Um, Joy. Hey, uh, I'm Joy. And uh, for the past three years, I've been working with a community called Imaginary Millions. And um, I've been doing that alongside the founder, Rob Major. And so we used to run monthly jam nights at the book club in Shoreditch. And the premise behind those was kind of like, no sign up sheet, no expectations, no judgment. And so the band would play for two hours straight and the mics at the front were always open and anyone's free to jump up and do whatever they want at any time. So singing, dancing, rapping, spoken word, whatever. Um, and so a lot of that was about creating a safe space for people who might not have performed or people who have not had that space to kind of explore their creativity in that way. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of bridging the gap between the audience and the performer. Um, and we don't run those nights anymore, um, but we still have a monthly radio show on Soho Radio and we're launching a community fund to help creatives and musicians to launch their projects. Um, yeah, during my nine to five, I guess I am a European project manager at Secretly Group, which is a group of independent record labels. And I dabble in all sorts of other, other musical endeavors, <laughs> let's say. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, we'll move on to Mimi next. Hi, okay, so I'm Mimi and I play bass in a queer feminist punk band called Dream Nails. Um, and we definitely like actively take a step into disrupting the gig space um, whenever we play gigs. Um, we always call women and non-binary people to the front at the start of every gig and um, we've worked with Good Night Out as well to train staff um, at a venue in London and 
yeah, we're always like trying to learn and take steps towards making the spaces safe, um, especially for people who want to come see us. And I think like as a band, you have a, a unique opportunity to do that when you're on the stage and you have the mic and you kind of have more control. So yeah, that's what we do. Amazing. Thank you. Um, move on to Where Are The Girl Bands next. Hi, um, I'm Ella from Where Are The Girl Bands. We are a Merseyside based project um, and we work mainly on Instagram as well as on our website to promote and celebrate women in music. And we also use our platform to host discussions around inclusivity, accessibility, and um, provide a platform for people to anonymously share their experiences um, around issues such as harassment, but also just generally their experience of the Liverpool music scene and um, to feed back to promoters and venues and um, to help make the scene more inclusive, more accessible, safer. Um, and we're also currently in the process of developing a programme of events focused around development and cross-discipline collaboration to further the community within the local music scene in Merseyside. Thank you, that's great. Um, and finally, hands off cup. Hi, can you all hear me? Sorry, I was having some problems before. Yeah, right. we can. Um, Hi, my name is Aleka and I'm the creator of Hands Off Club, which is a platform that raises awareness on sexual violence on nights out. So in places like pubs, clubs, bars, festivals and so on. So it gives people a platform to share their stories. And the main aims at the moment are to urge universities to get more involved and acknowledge their responsibility um, and to reach out to venues and get them to take a more active approach. So at the moment, um, we're mainly focusing on um, a collaboration with Where You At, which is an app that allows people to um, see where their friends are and to ping if there's ever like um, an emergency and mainly just like raising awareness on the uh, normalisation of sexual violence within these venues. Amazing. So everyone kind of working within, you know, for the same thing, but in very different areas. It's so nice to have such like a wide range of people on the panel. Um, so we're just going to kind of introduce the panel, why we wanted to do this, um, what kind of research there is and just our thoughts really about why this is such an important thing to be discussing now. Um, if Georgia, were you going to? Yeah. So obviously we're running this panel as, I mean, as people who work in the industry, I'm sure everyone's aware that sexual violence in the live music scene is absolutely rife. Um, and we wanted to see how folk within the industry itself envisioned their idea of what a safer space looks like and how they plan on or have been working to make their own spaces safer. Um, like all instances of sexual violence, um, sexual harassment and assault at gigs is notoriously hard to quantify so there's not much in the way of formal statistics out there um, obviously there was that really poignant YouGov poll in 2018 that came out um, where they discussed that around 43 percent of women under 40 had experienced some unwanted sexual behavior at festivals um, so I mean we can only imagine the statistics around uh, live music events and gigs is somewhat similar to this, if not worse or better. Um, we, yeah. Um, the UK live music census found that only a third of all music events, um, all music venues have some sort of um, anti-sexual harassment uh, policy in place. Um, and the one main researcher who is working in this field, uh, Rosemary Hill, who works at the Uni University of Huddersfield, um, found that sexual violence is happening and is a widespread problem at gigs. It impacts women's levels of participation with music. Some women have altogether stopped going to gigs and live music events because of the way they've been treated. Um, Victims and survivors face often face barriers in reporting incidents to venues and promoters. Uh, male venue staff in particular are often caught off guard when incidents occur. Um, 
women often take note of a venue's reputation in dealing with sexual violence and there's sort of an informal whisper network um, and obviously might stop going to some venues altogether because of the treatment they face in that venue um, and a strong sense of community can create an atmosphere in which sexual violence is deemed unacceptable and can help gig goers feel safer. Um, but often venues can face barriers in preventing and responding to sexual violence, like particularly in terms of uh, financial barriers. And as I'm sure me and B could tell you a lot about campaigning and, and training organisations have very limited resources. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of just an overview about why we've chosen to do this particular topic. Um, we kind of want to run this panel as like a discussion, but we do want to allow everyone to obviously answer each question. Um, so I think when we kind of, I'm going to go around for each question and people can each say a bit about it. But if you have a discussion point that you think will be really interesting to add on to a particular point, you can just do the little hand button. I haven't used that before, but it looks quite cool. Um, and then I can kind of like just coordinate who will speak next. Um, so I've got three questions that I'm gonna ask. Um, and anyone watching, if you have any questions for the end, um, you can use the little Q and A box. We might not have time for loads, but if anyone has anything they'd really like to ask, please do. Um, so first, I think it's really interesting to talk about how can safe spaces be implemented effectively? We talk about safe spaces a lot, um, but safe spaces can look completely different in very different venues and very different scenes. Um, so for you, what do you think is effective when implementing a safe space? Like what really needs to be done? Um, so we'll kind of maybe do the same order. So Emma, if you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, now safe spaces takes on an even bigger meaning because obviously you've got the safety of like, especially when we're doing the socially distance, like what, like COVID safety. So that's a whole, mm -hmm. a whole, th a whole thing that is, like, I think especially for like a lot of the events industry are all kind of just sort of, there's very, the guidelines are very confusing and it's sort of everyone's kind of got their own sort of trying to make their own way of what COVID safe is like. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then I don't know, for me, like the safe spaces is into mill was the first space that I ever really felt really safe in. And I think there was just the communication between the security, um, the people that were coming there as well. Like it's it's mm -hmm. like I like door policies and all those kind of things that are kind of very relevant now. Like I've been sort of done now back in the day when I was running the venue, we didn't really have that. Like I didn't have any really um, sexual harassment training until this kind of past year because it's always been working from event to event. And if you're kind of a very DIY organization, not kind of having that uh, like whether it's financial support or time as well to really do that training. So that I think has been a really positive outcome of this break is a lot of organisations and myself include have become a lot more educated within that. Um, a lot of the queer nights that I run, so like Grace and Decency, for instance, like we did have a, a door policy. We, but then with 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 that, we we actually had a, um, an account of sexual harassment at that event, and we really were trying to communicate this was a safe, spit queer space, um, and it does just take one person who ignores that, um, and it was reported to us um, after the event as well, so that was quite a difficult one to deal with, um, but we spoke directly to um, to the victim and um, they. The, this bounces on the night they did kick that person out but as an like as a promoter we weren't informed to this till afterwards so I think there's just being really communicating kind of accepting that it is likely to happen and preparing yourself for it to happen I think is really important and being open with them not trying to be like oh well it would like trying to get defensive about it being like okay apologizing this is happening in your space learning from learning from those experiences and ensuring that next time um, you do even more. So whether that is bet like having people on site that you can identify to go to and speak to at that event, um, particularly in kind of queer spaces, that's really important. Having breakout rooms so people are feeling overwhelmed. And I also think like agoraphobia and anxiety in a post pandemic world is gonna be massive. So kind of 
like thinking like I've a lot of my programming going back into the first events that we're doing at the end of May have been about kind of introducing people and making people feel safe in these spaces that they haven't been in for so long. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, would anyone like to add on to that? Yeah, I just I think it's it's always important to acknowledge that there is no such thing as a safe space. Like it's like there's always gonna be a, like there's no way of vetting everyone who comes in to make sure that there's no creeps coming in. Like there's always going to be someone there. Um, it's just like Emma said, like it's just knowing what to do in that situation, making sure you acknowledge that this can and will happen at most events and then being prepared for when it does happen. Um, yeah, I think sometimes people label, might label their events as a safe space, but it's, you know, it, there's no, and there's also no one size fits all for what that safe space looks like. And that's so important to acknowledge. Yeah, definitely. Um, where are the girl bands? Do you guys want to go next, Sam? Yeah, um, I completely agree with what Emma was saying. I think transparency and communication is definitely key. Um, ensuring that you have a dialogue with your audience and the community who comes to your events and you know like what they need to feel safe, what their concerns are, ensuring that they know like what the procedures are, who you can go to, um, you know, that they there are people in place who will support you if something does happen. And also like, yeah, not being defensive and being open and transparent about the situation in your venue and um, being open to have conversation, answer questions. Um, basically just having that dialogue with your community is incredibly important because even if you are a marginalized person yourself and you have like you know an idea of what would make you feel safe in a gigging space you don't necessarily speak for everyone who's in your audience and you need to hear all of those concerns in order to have like a safe space policy which effectively covers everyone yeah definitely I, yeah I agree that's really important kind of knowing that it's not going to be the same clean cut like experience for everyone we've got to kind of take that into account when we're creating safe spaces as well um maybe joy do you want to want to go next yeah um i mean for me i always think it's a lot about sticking to your intention and remembering who you're doing the nights for and what the aim is for those people to come away with after they've been to the night i think you have to be very clear and very intentional about what you're putting on and what you want them to get out of it. I think when people put on events, particularly for like marginalized groups, um, often as those events gain popularity, I think more and more people will try and get involved and try and get into the space. And because you obviously want your night to do well and you want more and more people to, to get involved and experience it, you can kind of forget who you're trying to protect um, and you can let people who might be potential oppressors into that space. Um, and I think, yeah, it's just key, key to stick to the intention all the way throughout. Um, like particularly with, with Imaginary Millions um, and the night itself that we used to create, there was a lot of stuff that we would think about that most people probably who attend the events would, wouldn't even see as a factor that affects their state or their thought process when coming into it. Um, and so like when I said we were bridging the gap between the audience and the performer, we were very keen to make sure that the stage wasn't a stage. So we were all on the same level, we were all on the floor, we were all coming into that space together so that you could feel like there's no gap between either of us. And just little things like that, like there was no entry fee. So it's like, we don't want to create any barrier for you getting on stage. Um, and so, yeah, I think from beginning to end of the experience, it's just key to think about, about those things and how people might be hindered in any way from fully experiencing what you want them to. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Does anyone want to add on to that one? Sure. Um... Yeah, I think it's my turn next anyways. Um, yeah, I really agree with what everyone's saying. And it's so hard to say what a safe space would look like, especially in gig spaces, because they're not 
they're like dark and you're in, in close contact, physical contact with strangers and things like that. It's like not the safest space to begin with. So doing all these things, doing everything you can, um, like we've done, I think Good Night Out is amazing and training the staff. Um, we've tried to, you know, have gender neutral and accessible toilets and pay what you can tickets and all that. And I think it's, you know, it, I agree it's like communication with the staff and it also has to do with like who is running that venue. And I'm, I know like some places we've played, we've put gender neutral toilet signs up and we like told them we're doing this and like, this is what we do. And they've just like come and taken them down. And like, you don't feel that kind of like support from the venue itself. So it's hard to be the band to say like, oh, we're inviting all these people, like saying it's a safe space. And then the venue doesn't have your back either. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've, we, we've canceled gigs and we haven't played gigs because the venue had a bad reputation or like people have messaged us and said, did you know this happened? And there, there's allegations against the staff at this venue. And just, I guess, just trying to be vigilant with that. And we have like, you know, emailed certain venues like that. And they've just, we've said, okay, we'll play here if you get this training. And then, you know, sometimes they don't. And then we just cancel the gig because it's not safe to invite our people who want to come see us to that mm -hmm. space. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting. Like we, we played this, um, the sisterhood stage at Glastonbury and I don't know if you know what the sisterhood stage is, but it's basically a very small, like indoor venue. And it's only for women, non-binary and trans people. And we have to like work the door and it's just like guys trying to come in and, and take over the space. It's like, this is the one space that's not yours. Like go somewhere else. You have the rest of the festival. You have the rest of the world. It's like leave us to this one space. Yeah. And it is really, yeah, it's really difficult to deal with that entitlement as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a complex thing. We have to try and find our way around. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, where are the girl bands you guys go? I was just going to add to that and say like I completely agree and I think if you're someone who is like a musician or a promoter and um, kind of putting pressure on venues to ensure that they do get that training and making sure that you don't stand for like negligence from the venues and yeah pulling out of things if you don't think that their policies are good enough is really important you know even if that means you lose out on an opportunity, it's fundamental to making sure that the scene that you're in is safer mm -hmm. because, you know, you're the person who basically has um, kind of the influence in that situation because you're showing them that they won't get people coming to their venue if they don't change the policies or the public stance that they take. So, yeah, I just want to say I agree yeah. with that. And I think, you know, as a promoter or musician, you do have a level of influence there and making sure that those things do get changed. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it's such a hard thing to do. Like, as you say, sometimes there's opportunities that you have to like turn down and it's kind of like, well, why, you know, you're the ones kind of then losing out on an opportunity, but it, it is really important to do that kind of thing. I agree. And I'd say that like, it's equally as important for men to be taking that stand as well. I think that that's where like a lot of the impact lies and um, they, have like they just naturally have like more influence I think in general in the industry that's speaking in very general terms obviously but I think the more that I, I think that's what when men can use their privilege to like make a stand if that makes sense and um you know I think if they start refusing certain gigs that don't meet their standards then that will have like a wider impact I think because I feel like otherwise I don't know it's important to do on, on, on both sides like within within all genders but I think yeah, using their privilege to, to to do that is like very impactful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. Um, do you wanna add anything else? Hands off club, do you wanna? Hi, I definitely agree with that last point that was just made that sadly men do have the upper hand in this situation. Um, so basically I've, 
a few weeks ago, I posted this thing about man- mandatory safe spots, which I've been working on for quite a while now. And um, it does sound difficult, but it's honestly not that hard. Like when you think of your own personal experiences and you think this one simple thing that could have been done could have changed literally everything. So since my incident, I have not stepped in the club after that. I'm just thinking like there could have been a place that I could have gone to. And it's honestly not that hard. So the whole, if you've seen the post, it's basically just... We need a well lit area that's not behind it, like in the security like room. You, we wouldn't want to do that. So like a well lit area that's open to everyone, that's easily accessible. It's got like little neon arrows pointing to it or something like that, uh, where we could just easily go. That's um, got well trained staff who've got like a book and a log of all these incidents that happen. So they can actually reflect at the end of the year and be like, oh, so we've had an increase, we've had a decrease. These are the people that we've banned. They're not coming back in. It's like, it's really not that hard to just like, keep a track of it and take some responsibility because in the long run if they think about it for their own selfish gain it is actually better for them because so many of us are now not returning to these venues because of the incidents that we go through so yeah yeah Yeah, that's really interesting actually I hadn't kind of thought of it like that as them like it's actually productive for them as well to to put these in place um so I'm gonna move on to kind of the next question um and I, we've kind of covered, you know, what the idea of a safe space is, but how easy is that for venues to implement kind of as we reopening post COVID? Because obviously things are changing. We're very aware that the industry is struggling a, a lot right now anyways. Um, so how can how can these safe spaces be implemented in venues post COVID? In the same order again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think like, I mean, a lot of people that and organisations that I work or affiliated with have done quite a, this has been the time that they've done this training. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose it's put, if, if that training's been done um, or is in the process of being done, then sort of implementing that and just taking these written documents and putting them into practice. I think that's the kind of bit that I want to make sure that, I really do with events coming up is that like all this kind of work and development that I've, I've been able to do over the last last year or so actually doesn't just sit on a Google Drive and just is kind of forgotten about. Um, and and so I, th- I think this this going into this immediate bit when it reopens, like I mean the socially distant seating bit hopefully will kind of it's gonna it's gonna be quite a different experience in terms of like it can be easy hopefully easier to manage incidents like this because there's people not sort of mixing I think when if June happens and that goes to schedule I think when people are like let back out at full capacity I think that's when people are going to have to be really diligent and kind of yeah like I think what like as well like identifying I think it was Joy who was saying like who your audience are, like who who you want to make sure feels really safe at those nights and prioritise them because there's not like there's not one safe space for all. That's just like 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 maybe a utopia somewhere, but it's relatively unrealistic because that different venues have got different accessibilities, like people's needs and kind of wants and to feel safe are really different. So yeah, identifying your audience is speaking to them kind of, yeah, like, and using what we've learned in the past year and not just forgetting about it. Like for me, the digital side of what I've been doing the past year has really opened up accessibility of the work that I produce and facilitate because there's a lot of people that won't be able to get in because of capacity issues but there's a lot of people that aren't able to go to venues because they're epileptic or they, they it's not accessible and actually the digital world for the first time has kind of made more people view creativity in the same way and we've had the same like obviously that's not completely across the board because there are, but more generally people are being able to see work in the same way. So kind of not forgetting what the digital accessibility means to people, because I think when I never thought about that before, do you know what I mean? It was a very DIY way of going and like, we didn't have the budget to kind of think about filming the shows or making the work for video. Um, but that's something I'm really taking forward and what I'm planning for Fat Fest in October is kind of this brief, this sort of, like digital and in real places and kind of allowing more people to to see the work because the digital work a lot of it's been free and that's been really accessible as well so yeah I don't know I'm rambling a bit here so I'll let someone else talk (laughs) no that it is it's really interesting it's such a like 
a whole different thing with now that with these digital and like digital safe spaces it's just not something that I don't know even at Girls Against we've been running for five years we haven't really ever had to do that um yeah yeah. Georgia did you want to chip in yeah I was just going to say I think a lot of the time as well accessibility does get left out of the discussion um like when people are discussing safe spaces and ultimately like that that is some people's safety um like that you like that is the crux of their safety is if it's accessible to them mm-hmm. um and like like with all things we're discussing uh, there is a big financial barrier to it obviously but I think this has been such a period of reflection for people and um yeah and and some people have just realized as well there are some really simple steps that they can take to make things safer and more accessible it doesn't have to be you know this grand uh redesign of the venue sometimes like it can just be really small simple steps that will just make someone feel that bit that bit safer yeah i think it wasn't i got some uh, training from attitude is everything and they were saying even like for sounds in the city which is a multi-venue like what how many steps there are in a venue because obviously there's I've kind of thought of accessibility as like wheelchair accessible but Mm -hmm. some people who have got mobility issues it might decide whether they're coming to a venue just simple things like that like that doesn't take any money or training to do that work and doing the kind of an accessibility almost as you would a risk risk assessment Mm -hmm. um is something that everyone should be doing because it's you would do it for the safety of your general audience so why aren't you kind of focusing it on on people that have specific needs yeah yeah definitely yeah they're really great really great organization as well doing some really good work um joy do you want to yeah um i guess well in terms of like covid safety i feel like venues have had a whole year of opening reopening closing and all of that um to kind of tweak the best way to suit their customers um and to implement those safety measures as well and i think as we move I'm like I don't want to say out of COVID because I think that's going to stick with us for some time but as we move into like more open spaces I think it's key for venues to still keep as many of those safety measures in place um, as possible and maybe not in a mandatory sense but just in a way that makes people feel more comfortable so whether whether that's you know, reducing capacity in their venues, you know, a venue that might say that um, we could fit 2000 people in here, you might go down to 1750, just so that there's more breathing room and more space for people to just slowly get into being in crowded venues again. Um, I think we all mentioned that we're kind of feeling excited, but a little bit anxious to be back in those spaces. And I think you know, as excited as most people will be, you might not realize until you're in that space that you're like, oh, this is a bit confronting or this is a bit much. And so it's kind of trying to anticipate your customer's needs um, in that sense. I think, yeah, we've all mentioned accessibility as well. I think that's key. And for a long time, I feel like we've been building up to this as well. Um, Prior to COVID, I feel like, you know, you've been seeing more British sign language interpreters at different music events or in different spaces or, you know, more listen backs or look backs or transcriptions um, of events and panels and things like that. And I think it's key for us to continue that um, because for a lot of people, especially people who will have been shielding or people who are more vulnerable, they won't be coming out on June 21st and they're still going to want to hang and they're still going to want to have a good time. Uh, and it's important to not forget about those people and just kind of be caught up in the mirth of like, yes, we could finally be outside. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, like how Boiler Room have been having online sets and, and things like that um, throughout lockdown, you know, it's not, it's not ideal. It's not the same for those of us who like clubbing and going to raves and things like that. But even just being able to see that knowing that your friends might be there or being able to watch it at home and watch it back and kind of experience it with them that's still just as meaningful so I think to bring it all kind of back to a point <laughs> um, I think it's just key for venues to think about the people who might not 
be as able to come into their spaces as we once might have. Um, and to, yeah, consideration is key. Consideration is key. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I, I mean, definitely it's, it's a new way of like kind of watching events, but as you say, like I think it's so important for people who have actually found comfort now in being able to like enjoy that without having to physically go to a space. Um, Mimi, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with all of those points. Um, it's going to be like, I feel like it's, there's a big reset button and hopefully, you know, when things start opening up, the venues will be thinking about this way more probably, yeah, just because of COVID, but also like it is a good thing that they're resetting and thinking about this. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I definitely think the live stream shows are amazing. Like we had a few, we had three live stream shows and it was just like people really liked being able to just tune in from their house. And I think that should definitely be something that keeps going for bands. Um, if you have the means, I mean, it is hard to do that financially. Like we were lucky enough to have a grant from PRS to kind of like get our webcams and stuff and it can be really expensive. Um, and I mean, a lot of these things, like, like everyone was saying, like to make venues accessible is, it, it can be expensive. Like um, when, when we know like a venue doesn't have like an accessible toilet or something, we'll try and like contact the places around it and say like, oh, can, can people go into this gig tonight, use your bathrooms or something like that. And, you know, as, we are like a self-managed band and stuff. We don't really make money. We don't get paid for doing it. And it's it's hard sometimes when, you know, we did do a, a crowdfunder for a BSL interpreter, like for our, our main London show that we were doing and stuff. And it would just be, you know, nicer if this was like the normal thing to do. And if like bigger bands did this as well, especially like bigger bands who call themselves like feminist bands and stuff, but aren't actively like, making their gigs accessible so I don't know hopefully like when things start opening up that's something they're thinking about um yeah yeah definitely no I agree it'd be great to see kind of this just becoming a norm and yeah as you say like not just kind of the people like you know all of you guys doing amazing work but actually people above that who have the capacity and the money yeah mm -hmm. um where are the girl bands? Do you guys want to go next? Sure, yeah. Um, we're actually presenting our very first events, really, um, over the summer, like physically, um, a, a venue in the Wirral um, opposite Liverpool called Bloom Building have um, very kindly like offered us um, their space. And so we'll be hosting various events there over the summer. And actually, we've, we've been putting a lot of thought into that idea of like reopening gradually um after covid and, and this idea that like you know although you know it, it, it's it's important to ease people in because although it's like legal to sort of do whatever you want now i think you've got to bear in mind that like obviously not everyone will be completely comfortable and i think actually the whole pandemic just sort of with, with well, without disregard and everything else to do with it but it's been an opportunity in this sense venues to like step back and reassess their policies and so on have training as emma suggested before and um, but also to reconsider like the gig space um, and what it stands for and whether we do want to return to like more traditional like for not even traditional just like um the the normal standard now is to like stand around holding a drink but i think um we've been given the opportunity to rethink that space and think well should it be like more distance like should it have that sort of um, element of like having to go and like buy a drink and like socialize and things like that. Should you talk over someone playing music? Um, we're not like against that. We're just sort of questioning those those norms and like why it's become like that, like the live music space. And so I think it's been interesting for us to plan these gigs with that in mind. And so we're going to be hosting events that are gradually going to become, you know, I think we're going to start at a point where they they still sort of sit in line with social distance and, and things like that because I think we need to do, we need to like make gradual steps and um, but it's been an interesting opportunity to rethink the gig space. 
I felt and like even just things like the involvement of alcohol in gig spaces in a sense that you can't really go to a gig and not have the involvement of alcohol and that kind of is an accessible an accessibility issue in itself because not everyone feels comfortable um, in those kind of environments and it you know presents issues to certain people um, and like presenting alternatives to um, the kind of standards of like a dark room like I know Mimi was saying earlier like it, it if you know you have your own anxieties about going into a dark space where you're in crowds of people and everyone's you know drinking and there are substances involved there aren't really alternatives to those kind of situations um, so maybe now is a time to think about um, alternatives and maybe asking like the communities that you work with like what would be your ideal live music experience like if you could just you know maybe you would want to like I don't know lie down and listen to music or you know just these kind of like alternatives to the standards that we have which could maybe help in terms of like say if you had like anxiety around returning to gig spaces or just not to do with the pandemic just generally you have anxiety around big crowds or dark spaces making sure that there are accessible alternatives for people um and once things go kind of like back to normal and there aren't limits making sure that those alternatives are still in place for people and that you don't have to kind of like like what joy was saying you can still be involved in live music without having to put yourself into a situation that you're not comfortable with or isn't safe or accessible for you yeah definitely and i think it's really interesting about what you're saying asking kind of people what they value about music and like it'd be really interesting to do some kind of like research and surveys coming out of you know the pandemic being like what actually is it about these spaces that people love and why reminding ourselves of like the important things and what people value from those spaces definitely um hands off club do you want to add anything there yeah sure um so in terms of funding um, so like it'd be as simple as just putting posters around and showing that this is like a place that has zero tolerance for these things like um, if you think about it not many venues actually actively say that we don't stand for this I know there'll always be creeps that will be doing what they want to do but if a venue is showing that we don't stand for this it'll make a lot of people feel a lot safer and it will actually deter some people from doing anything because they know that there's people watching them they know that there's people actually taking like notice of this and with like funding we've got uh, I know you all probably heard about the uh, undercover police in these venues and it's just like that the amount of money that's probably going into that like you could do something else with it so we need to think about the deeper like wider issues that it's not just venues that need to be doing something it's the police it's institutions like universities secondary schools consent classes like that would be so easy so st andrews in scotland they've got mandatory consent classes for all students and just start in from secondary school and just implementing these and teaching people that this is not what you can be doing when you like when you grow up and when you go to these venues you can't be doing stuff like this so in terms of funding like if we know that venues are struggling right now but there are other institutions that can step up and do a lot more instead of sending out more undercover police officers who are going to give us insane anxiety yeah oh, yeah definitely yeah i agree with that so much yeah emma did you want to yeah i'll just I'll just sort of mirror what you're saying like security companies are uh, that is like some of the unsafest spaces i've been in has been because of the door staff and I think until I started working with Serenity Security at the mill, like the people that we had beforehand, it like there's the misogyny within even just hiring a company then like was like, I remember the like, number of incidents when we were interviewing for people, the kind of misogyny related to that. And yeah, like you're having like really, really good door staff that kind of understand it. Like Serenity's policy is always to have one female identifying person as part of the security team. Um, Cause yeah, like, and, and just not kick like we are where the mill was, was in, like was not in the middle of town or anything so kicking someone out was like a zero policy for that because we were like no I don't really care how fucked they are if, if if kicking someone out when they're intoxicated onto a street even in the center of town like that's really dangerous so kind of having like the security teams doing this work is vital as well because venues and promoters can have all the best intentions but if the people that are actually looking after you on the night aren't making you feel safe and aren't doing the right things to kind of enforce what your policies are it's kind of pointless 
Yeah, for sure. This is like probably one of the biggest barriers um, we face that uh, Girls Against is working with security because especially like the SIA are so set in what they think security has to be. Um, and yeah, we've really struggled to to break into like break down that barrier between security because um yeah, they, uh, like I said, they, I think they are just so set in the ways and they know that that works. They're going to get money either way. Like, yeah, but I think also that is sort of somewhat changing now. Like, obviously, there have been quite a lot of high profile cases of security really manhandling people. Um, and they are starting to listen, but they've definitely been one of the slowest industries to actually take any of this work on board, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just to, to echo that. I mean, we've had, we, since we've started doing this campaign, we've tried to get security involved. And yeah, it's very, it's a, it's a difficult task, let's say. Um, and did you, you got your hand raised? So do you want to? Yeah, like I just like completely want to echo what everyone said. And um, when we've done research within um, like our community, like the main thing which came back which makes people unsafe in venues is the security and the fact that like if something does happen who do you go to because you don't trust the security either so it's like what what's the protocol especially when like the venue perhaps says you know report these incidents to this person but the person you meant to report to is kind of like not someone that you would feel safe going to and um, so I think yeah like completely agree and I know that is an issue that's like not necessarily in the hands of the venue themselves because even if the venue has what seems to be a great policy if at the end of the policy you have to go to someone who you don't trust the policy falls through basically yeah definitely i um, i think it's it's so hard kind of navigating the different groups that are involved in creating these spaces because yeah as you say like you can have a venue on board and you can have the promoters on board and then there's just kind of one external security guard who's not and it it falls apart so it's yeah it's really important um we have kind of 10 minutes and there is a question that's been um asked so i'm gonna do that at the end but i want to kind of talk about maybe some positive implementations of safe spaces just kind of if anyone wants to chip in with doesn't even have to be through your work but have you been to a really like successfully implemented space where you felt really safe or have you done that yourself through your own work just kind of giving them like a shout out and how that was done really uh, I mean for me as in Tamil has been my was the first introduction to a safe space and is my little euphoria now and it and I think it like yeah it's just always been for me a very like without even really kind of trying to be a safe space it just kind of has and now it's kind of identifying more about its queer history and because even when we had the club it wasn't like a queer space or, or labeled that it just was that and it and so yeah and I think like we the communication we had when we when we met Serenity Security that was just a match make in heaven because we could have a really honest conversation with them and being like that there are some nights our club nights when people are going to be on drugs and we want like like that I want to make sure like that's going to happen there's little obviously we could do what we can to but there's that is a part of club culture and we could have a really honest conversation about how we want to deal with these people like it's not like if they're too far don't just kick them out those kind of things so yeah I think yeah for me is into mill and like the white hotel as well have been kind of where I felt really really comfortable um and yeah I want to shout both those spaces out because I love them yeah yeah amazing anyone else have ones who'd like to yeah um I guess the first time I was at an event where I could really see like they thought about all of the touches and all of the ways to make it right for the people they were targeting was actually Black Girl Fest, um, which started, I think, in 2018. And the most recent one that I went to, you know, as soon as you enter, everyone that's serving you, everyone that's on the team is a Black woman or a Black person that's non-male identifying. and 
you know, the music that they're playing throughout the day is all by black women. Um, and it's just subtle things like that, like all the speakers are black women, all of the people who are contributing to the panels and things like that. So I was like, that's really encouraging to see um, where that's not normally represented elsewhere. Um, and so, yeah, things like that were cool. I think the first time I went to a space that felt safe, but never really identified or never really advertised himself as a safe space was uh, the group called Ladies Music Pub. I don't know if um, everyone's familiar with them, but they've been around for a while now. And I think I first went to one of their meetings in like 2016. And I was just starting out um, in the music business and like trying to figure out what I wanted to do and trying to find my feet. And yeah, I think they were just really helpful and played a pivotal role in me being where I'm at now um, and just kind of made it an open forum for you to speak about your experiences or hear people who had experienced different things within the music industry as non-male identified people. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of safe spaces at the moment and I'm not gonna list them all, but there's a lot, there's a lot popping up, which is great to see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they sound, that sounds amazing. I hadn't heard of them before. Um, any others? And Georgia, feel free as well if you want to talk about any. I just sort of, yeah, I, I wanted to echo what I was saying before as well. Like, and I think interestingly, some of like the, the places I felt safest haven't yet necessarily labelled themselves as a space safe space. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the best way to put it, but some of the best, the most safe spaces I've felt have been also some of the most debauched <laughs> if that makes sense like I know like Emma uh, has like helped put on like body horror and you've been involved in bollocks and stuff um I'm like bollocks is like one of the safest I've ever felt at a space like you know um it's allowed me to express myself in a way that I wouldn't normally feel comfortable with um sort of present myself more queer <laughs> than I would normally um and you know go wearing bar barely any clothes but also <laughs> feel really safe um and yeah it's, it's quite interesting that relationship as well I think um that yet yeah, sometimes the most like hedonistic spaces are the safest um and I think there's something in that I think because they have to a lot of the time think about that more mm. um yeah yeah definitely yeah that's really it's really interesting kind of idea of labeling something as a safe space but actually the ones that kind of just do that naturally and as we were talking about earlier like having that as a norm like it's it should be it's not like a kind of oh we are a safe space like everywhere ultimately should be um yeah hands off club do you want to go as we're speaking, I just got a notification um, saying social distancing not to be not needed at big events. Boris Johnson just said, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, great timing for that. <laughs> yeah, it's it, I mean, it highlights like kind of the topic of this conversation is so, you know, so relevant at the moment, definitely. Um, so we literally just got a couple of minutes. I did want to um, the question that someone's asked. Um, they said, how do you promote or protect and create a safe space venue for the LGBTQ plus community? What advice would you give? Um, so I guess anyone who's kind of put on those promotion or protecting those groups of people, any advice that you'd have for, I guess, setting up kind of their own space? I think that's... Um, yeah, I think like the spectrum of LGBT plus people, even within that is going to be difficult to find a safe space that is going to be like, like going to make safe space for everyone. It's like the trans community, it's really important from speaking to my trans friends that they have spaces that is for them. And so, yeah, I think you've just got to sort of what we've been doing, like I work particularly with a lot of like sort of alternative queer audiences and communities, a lot of fetish 
um, nights and those kind of things where what George was saying, like for me, accepting my body has come from being in those safe spaces. But then some people would probably enter like a sex or fetish club and feel really uncomfortable. So I think it is just like, yeah, be defining what your night is and what it is to it and how you can make those people feel safe. Because, yeah, like a sort of very sort of cis male gay night is not going to be inclusive for a trans community um, and, and vice versa. Do you know what I mean? Like it is important that, that cis gay men have those those spaces that they feel super comfortable um, and the same for the lesbian community. And by, do you know what I mean? There, It's a very like it's a huge spectrum of people. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of define. For me, it's kind of trying to define who you want to make feel comfortable in those in your space in your night. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, anyone want to add anything else, like to that question, or just in general? Um... I think, like in general, obviously we can't speak on behalf of those events uh, that you know create safe spaces specifically for LGBT. Uh, community because we haven't hosted any events yet but I'd say that like what we've been looking at is having representation both on and off the stage mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's like it's like Joy was talking about with um, Black Girl Fest like having 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 people in all of those roles I think is really important like like visibility and stuff like that Um, I think we were planning some events like the idea of like an all an all girl event, but being like having girls not only on the stage, but also like as in roles like security and in roles like behind the bar or like rigging the lights, like technicians, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think visibility would be an important one there. Yeah, definitely. That's something we've really actually been trying to work on at Girls Against recently, kind of getting people involved and speaking to, you know, non men behind the scenes and how they can be included in those conversations as well because it's it there's other people in the events than just kind of like the artist or the audience members um so yeah it's been an hour this has been an amazing amazing conversation thank you everyone um this has been recorded so we'll be able to share it back people can watch it if they've missed it um because it's been yeah super important conversation so thank you everyone for joining um thank you to everyone who watched um and for people who asked questions and yeah i hope you guys have a good rest of the day thank you so much for being involved um and hopefully we'll get to do some events all together soon and we can you know do some keep in touch do some great stuff so thank you so much thank this was thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.